it's just a wonderful thing that we get to sit or stand in a place like this as the family of God and proclaim our living hope in Jesus. And I wouldn't want to do it with anybody else but you. And we're glad you're here. We have uh, many that are our guests today, and we love you. And we're glad that you're here. And we just want to be um, the church of Jesus Christ. That's all we're striving to be. And so we're going to try to uh, live by this book, the Word of God, and do everything by it that we can. And um, really want to encourage you to be back tonight at 6 o'clock and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, bring those kids Bring every one of them, invite, because they're going to they're gonna get uh, to hear about the precious gift that we've been given, uh, you know, our living hope through Jesus Christ. And so um, be, be sure you come back and support this. And we just appreciate so much how many people have been working, not for hours or really days, but for weeks on preparing for this week. And so we're glad that you're here and that that week is here. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we bring glory to your name. We bless your holy name this morning. Thank you for this time together as we focus on the hope that we have in Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There was a school system in a large city that had implemented a program, a pretty neat little program, where they would hire teachers outside of class time to go into the hospitals for children that were in the hospital and keep teaching them so that they wouldn't get behind on their schoolwork. And so uh, one particular teacher was hired to go and do that. And uh, she went to the school and the, the one who had hired her and, and said, how do you want me to do this? And she said, well, here's the, the boy's name and the hospital room number that he's in. And uh, right now in his class, he's studying nouns and adverbs. So we need to keep him up with that while he heals in the hospital. She said, no problem. She went to the hospital later that afternoon and she went to that boy's room, but she was startled because what they didn't tell her was that he had been badly, badly burned and he was in great pain. And so it really kind of set her aside. I mean, it bothered her a lot to see a little boy in this condition, obviously. And so um, she was dishuffled as she spoke to him and said, listen, I'm here, this is my name, and I'm here, and we're going to continue on with your classwork on nouns and adverbs. And so she did the best she could, and she left that day pretty discouraged, really feeling like she hadn't done a very good job. The next day she came back to the hospital. The nurse grabbed her before she went in, this teacher, and said, what did you do that boy? And she goes, oh, my goodness, I have no I, Whatever it is, I'm so sorry. She said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't know what I'm talking about. Like, he's doing so much better right now. Like, I've been, this nurse said, I've been really, really worried about this young man. I mean, really going downhill in his health and a bad attitude about things. And everything has completely turned around. What did you do different? Because now he's determined not to die, but determined to live. Two weeks later, she figured out what happened. The boy explained to her that he, she, he had completely given up hope until that teacher arrived. He said everything changed when he came to a simple realization. And here's how he expressed it. You know, they wouldn't send a teacher to work on nouns and adverbs with a dying boy, would they? Hope is one of the most powerful things that we possess. Do you know this? You see, hope in the Bible, that word that's found inside this Bible is not something in the future that we may or may not have. We do that all the time in our society. Man, I really hope I get that promotion. I really hope that pays well. I really hope that goes my way. I really hope that doesn't happen. And it may or it may not happen. That is not the, that is not the original word for the word hope in Scripture. The word is el peace for hope. L-E-P-I-S. That's the Greek word for hope. It means actually a joy and a confident. Listen closely to this. This is awesome stuff. A joy and a confident expectation of your salvation. 
It comes from a word meaning to anticipate and to expect. That's why we get together and we sing about our living hope, 1 Peter 1. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 reads like this in verse 1. Therefore I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk in a worthy calling uh, of, of which you've been called with all lowliness and gentleness, long suffering, bearing with one another in love, in endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, and just as you were called in one hope of your calling, you have the calling of hope today. If you are in Christ Jesus, like you get to own this, it's a part of your identity now. Hope is everything to us as a Christian. Not the idea of the world that we just mentioned a while ago, I hope it happens, but it's our great expectation that because of what Jesus did, it's happening. And we put all of our confidence in that. But here's the deal, brethren. Number one, outside of Christ, a sinner has none. You got to know that. No matter how old, no matter how young, if you're outside of Christ, you're that age of accountability where you know the difference. You know how to think for yourself. You know, even Job's friends knew this. Job 8 says, So are the paths of all who forget God, and the hope of the hypocrite shall die. Another friend of Job said, but the eyes of the wicked will fail and they shall not escape for their hope is loss of life. Job knew it. Job 27, for what is the hope of the hypocrite that he may gain much if God takes away his life? And also, did you know that a great example of living without hope are the Gentiles in Ephesians 2 says, therefore, remember, you once were Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the co covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. 1 Thessalonians 4 says, but I want... I don't want you to be ignorant, my brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. You know what Paul's saying right there? You don't need to worry about those who have died in Christ. You don't have to grieve like those out there who have to grieve for their loved ones who are outside of Christ. You don't have to grieve that way. That's why it's such a beautiful thing to come together in an auditorium like this. And maybe we even have a body up here. And we have sorrow and we have grief, but not like those who have no hope for that sister or that brother in Christ. And it saddens me to talk about this today because I want everyone to go there. I want everyone to live eternally with Christ Jesus. And those outside of Christ, though, are not. They can't. Hopelessness has to be the most terrifying thing in the world when one is lost, has no future, no great expectation, no assurance. They're always wondering, always concerned about it, but not the Christian. You see, when one is outside of Christ Jesus, he's outside of the body of Christ, the church. They're one and the same. That's what the Bible teaches. Anyone in Christ who's obeyed the gospel is in the church. They're a part of the saved. Here's what that looks like. Do you know that during the days of the flood, before the flood, Noah spent about 100 years preaching to the evil people? Genesis 5, Genesis 7, 2 Peter 2 tells us he was a preacher of righteousness and no one listened and no one obeyed. And then the rain started to fall. And then the rain, the water started pouring forth and bursting forth. 
And it was at this point that they realized that the door is shut. And we're on the outside of the ark. It's a horrible position to be in. Outside of Christ. And you, you have to know that you, you have to know this today. That there's going to come a point, the door's going to be shut. That Jesus and his mighty angels are going to come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and haven't obeyed the gospel. And the door of the ark is going to close. And we have to get to people first. You have to be a Noah to somebody. If you don't, who's going to? I don't know the people you know. A lot of them aren't going to come and hear a lesson in this building. I don't have the contacts that are in your phone. I don't, I don't have those. You don't have mine. I have a responsibility because I sit here today, I stand here today, and I burst forth with song about my living hope in Jesus with all of you and those outside the ark. They need to know. They need to know. And you need to know. Don't you dare speak of it. Of the hope that you're not sure you have. Because that's not hope. That's foolish talk. That's crazy. To speak of some, something like an expectation that you have, but when you lay your head down, you're not sure you have it. Because you're not sure you're in Christ. See, the beauty of this is that inside of Christ, though, a sinner abounds in hope. I mean, the Bible teaches it over and over. Romans 15 and verse 13, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in faith that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. i got to be honest with you, that verse, if that doesn't light your fire, I don't know what to do for you, right? Like, you, you get to abound in hope because of what God did for you through Jesus. And if you're in Jesus, your face ought to show the hope. Like, you should present that to the world. You need to present it to you. We abound in a great expectation that I belong to Jesus. He belongs to me. And I'm spending eternity with Him. It is my heavenly... I have a heavenly citizenship. I don't belong here. I belong with Him because I'm in Christ. And some of us today, we need to start living that hope. Are you listening, church? Ephesians 1 and verse 12, in order, Paul says, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of His glory. Paul said to Timothy, in 1 Timothy 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. Those Gentiles I spoke to you about in that last point, those who were afar off, who had no hope, do you understand that the reason Jesus came was to give them the hope? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13, but now Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You own the hope now. Colossians 1 speaks of the same people. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of his glory in this mystery among the Gentiles, in which Christ in you, the hope of glory. Brethren, Christians at Wiley, come on. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We abound in hope today. This hope is, isn't based on something that you've done, though. 
is based on what God did through Jesus. Some of you need to accept this. You don't, you don't get to brag and boast about a living hope because you did something awesome. He's the one who did something awesome. You just came to it. You just responded to it. You just obeyed the gospel. And now within your hearts, we get to come together on a day like this and abound in hope because we know where we're going. Isn't that awesome? We know who we are. We know that all the tough stuff that we go through is very purposeful stuff. God creates purpose out of it. And so let me leave you this. Our hope in Christ is how we stay motivated as Christians. Listen, brethren. Romans chapter 8. Not only that, this is verse 23, but we also had the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption and the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. That, that's, that would be a reality. Our reality hasn't happened yet, but we're inside the reality. But it hasn't come to fullness yet. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Like, I'm going to I'm going to endure this hardship. I'm going to persevere through it because I, have, I own the hope. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, we give thanks to God for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience in hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when the odds are against us on earth, it's okay. It's okay that this week something falls apart in your life. It's okay. Persevere in hope. Wait on the Lord. Everything is set for you. It's okay. Go through it. Don't run from it. Go through it. Accept it as it is. And go through the hardship. It's okay if something changes with your body. Deal with it and persevere in hope. It's okay when you lose something. I'm not saying you like it. We don't like it. I don't like it. You don't like it. I'm not inviting it. I'm just saying when it happens, it's going to happen. Persevere in hope. Things are already eternally set for you. Dude walked up to a Little League game and he said, Hey, buddy. He talked to this kid who's in the dugout. He said, Hey, hey, hey. What's the score? And the little fella said, 18 nothing. Dude. Man, I'm sorry, man. That's discouraging. He said, what do you mean discouraging? We ain't got to bat yet. <laughs> right? What are you talking about? The story ain't done. So some of y'all need to stop. You, you need to stop finishing the story up in your book. Let him finish it. D don't write this all the way out. Go through it today. Your, your book's not finished. It's not the conclusion yet. You're still alive. Let him do this. Keep your hope in place and persevere in patience. Keep going. Don't stop. Things may look and feel overwhelming. I get that. Shed the tears. It's okay. But don't give up. Because those of us in Christ, we still win. Because we're locked into our eternal future. It's something I didn't know. Obsolete words. I actually didn't know that. I didn't know some words. I'm not talking about archaic words, which are old. Maybe even they're tired. They've been falling out of use. Obsolete words, simply not used any longer. One literary site puts it this way. Believe it or not, words do 
disappear. For an English word to be considered obsolete, there can't be any evidence of it since 1755, the year of publication of Samuel Johnson's dictionary. So to this point, Joseph Parker, a, a pastor and a writer, provided commentary on the closing words of Isaiah 3510, which says, sorrow and sighing will flee away. Here's what he said. When searching for the meaning of certain words in a dictionary, you'll occasionally come across a word that's marked obsolete. The time has come for sorrow and sighing to become obsolete in our lives. The things that mess up life here and now will become a part of the past. I didn't know there were obsolete words, but you know what? Now that I think about it, spiritually speaking, those of us in Jesus, we have some obsolete words in our, in our life. Hopelessness. Meaninglessness. Without purpose. Sorrow and sighing. And death. All of these words are replaced with joy and gladness, purpose, and meaning, and direction, and eternity. My brothers and sisters, keep your eye on the goal. Keep it on the one hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Stay in Christ Jesus. And if you're not in Christ, you don't have hope. And I'm not okay with that. And you should not be okay with that. Please don't be okay with that. Submit to your Creator. Turn your life to Him. Put your trust and your faith, your, your confidence. Put Him in Him. Put it in Him. Put it in His Son, Jesus. Today. Be determined to turn your back on your sins and obey the gospel. Put Christ on in baptism. That's what the Word teaches. Jesus said, He who comes to faith, we call it belief, but He who comes to faith and is baptized, shall be saved. Anyone who doesn't come to faith will be condemned. Mark 16, 16. Obey the gospel. The death, burial, and resurrection, being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk in newness of life. It's not something you're doing. It's something that's done to you to accept his promises and his blessings and his redemption. And then live for him. Be sold out to him. Put all of your hope, put all of your stock in Him and live for Him for the rest of your days. So let's close this out. Is your hope fixed on Jesus? Because to fix your hope <laughs> on anything else, you name it, doesn't matter what you say, on anything else, is a misplaced hope. It will fail you. You put it in your spouse. You put it in your child. You put it in your preacher. You put it in your church. The church doesn't save. Jesus saves. The church is, is the saved. Put, your, put all your hope in him. And then joy everlasting, complete fulfillment, direction and meaning, purpose is all yours. And you get to persevere through everything that happens because your hope is placed in Jesus.